Hi friends, this is Trish and welcome to Teacher Therapy. School is starting back up for many of you and it kind of got me thinking about new teachers and how scary and stressful it is. And I wanted to give you my top 10 classroom management tips that will make your year so much better. The number one focus for the first few weeks of school really needs to be you laying down your rules, your expectations, and setting a culture and a climate for your room. And I hope that these 10 tips will really help you with that. Without further ado, let's get started. Number one, you want to choose rules that you will be able to enforce consistently. If you have no idea what kind of rules to choose, I would highly recommend talking to teachers at your school to see what kind of rules that they have in place. You're also going to want to think about school-wide rules and even district-wide rules. As soon as possible, you really want to find out what consequences or rewards that you are allowed to give for your school setting. If you can, you also want to find out out in a sly way from other teachers, what will administration back you up on? For example, there has been years where I tried to create rules around homework and create consequences for not turning it in, only to find out that my school absolutely wasn't going to back me up on it at all. So you want to know that preferably before the start of this school year, because unfortunately, any standards or goals that you set and don't enforce is kind of going to reduce credibility and trust between yourself, your students, and their parents. So you want to figure these things out as soon as possible. Keep in mind that the general consensus is that you should start a little bit stricter than maybe how you plan to be for the rest of the year. It's always better to start strict and loosen up a little bit later and to kind of start loosey-goosey, realize it's a disaster, and then try to rein it in when the kids are already out of control. I also need you to be ready that some kids might test you on the first day of school and you have to be ready for that. The worst year of teaching I ever had was when I made a leap from teaching fourth grade to eighth grade and I made a leap from teaching in a charter school to a private school and I had all kind of assumptions in my mind about how that was going to go and I did not expect for kids to start testing me right out the gate. The older the students, the more they're likely to test you. So I don't don't want to scare you, but you definitely want to think about, are you willing to hand out consequences on the first day of school? Are you willing to call parents on the first day of school? And again, if you're not really sure what's appropriate for your setting, I would definitely ask other teachers about this. When creating rules, I kind of want you to think about what rules are you really willing to go to bat for? As I've mentioned in some of my other videos, there is a tendency for parents to want to fight you on rules, students to want to fight you on rules, and your administration might not be willing to back you up on rules. So you have to think about what do you value so much for your classroom that you are willing to stand your ground and really enforce it come heck or high water. If this seems kind of overwhelming to you, I want you to start by thinking about what level of talking and noise that you're comfortable with in your classroom. Some teachers don't mind kind of a low buzz of talking during transitions or during work time, and other teachers want it to be absolutely silent as often often as possible. And those are things you really want to think about before you start school, because if students sense that you kind of are not sure of yourself and you don't really know what you expect, they will take advantage of that. This could be its own video, so let me know if you have any questions about this first one. So let's move on to number two. In the first few weeks of school, you want to aim for 100% compliance with students following your rules. I have a little bit of a theory. In the beginning of the year, students tend to be a bit more pliable and they will tend to adjust to whatever you set the expectation as. But as the year goes on, let's say <laughs> by the time you get to May, sometimes your student's behavior could drop as much as 20%. So if you start the year with 100% compliance, you're not letting anything go, you're really sticking to your rules, you're kindly calling out misbehavior, then by the time you get to May, maybe your students are 80% behaving. But if you start the year with 80% of kids kind of sort of following your expectations, then by the time you get to May, it's going to be rough. So what does this mean practically? A lot of teacher colleges or even districts will recommend that the first few weeks of school are filled with tons of fun games and getting to know you activities and icebreakers. And I have definitely tried that. What I found is that it's really easy for those things to get out of control. And then it sets the precedent for 
your students that you're not the one that's really in charge. It can be really tempting since they are laughing and smiling and they seem so happy to just kind of let things go. But I would recommend not starting the year off like that at all. You want to start in a measured, controlled manner, and you can definitely still utilize strategies like turn and talk to your partner, or even if you have your students in pods, they can discuss something in groups. But I would kind of shy away from activities where they're getting up out of their chair and roaming around the room and those kind of icebreakers. It's just way too easy for it to go off the rails. I would also highly re recommend calling out good behavior and focusing on students that are doing the right thing. And I learned something when I went through the Teach for America program and it was called the BMC and they called it behavior narration. So basically if you told students to do something as a class and you saw them doing it, you would say something like, you know, I see Billy taking out his notebook. I see that Cassandra is ready to learn. She's sitting up straight and she's paying attention. I see Javon with his pencil in his hand. And if you've never heard of this, it sounds a little crazy. I'd recommend you look it up. But the effect that that has is you are calling out the fact that you see the good things that people are doing and it kind of makes the rest of the class want to be on that positive streak of doing the right thing and following your expectations. It's definitely worth looking up and I could do a separate video on this too. I would also recommend in the first few weeks of school being really diligent about tracking every single assignment. And if students aren't turning things in, I would nicely ask them about it, look them in the eye and say, oh, where's your about me essay? It just really sets the tone that you're expecting for your work to be turned in. If you're allowed to in your school, I would even recommend doing some kind of little chart where you're doing a star or a check by every single assignment that students turn in. You can even make your first assignment of the year super easy. It can be something like a welcome letter that talks about your rules, expectations, a little bit about yourself that the parents have to sign and bring back. But you definitely want to get a feel for how much your students are going to follow through as quickly as possible because that's going to give you important information that you need. By aiming for 100% compliance in the first few weeks, you're also going to quickly see, unfortunately, who your trouble students are. And that can also help you to make a plan going forward, such as seating charts, whether or not parents need to be called. And if you're at a school where their student has been, maybe you can even ask their teacher from last year some questions about what worked with them. I know for me, there was a real temptation to kind of tiptoe the first few weeks of school because things seem like they're going well and you don't want to feel like you're ruining it by asking a student why they're not doing what they're supposed to be. But if you let things slide and you let things go because you want to feel like you're being nice, at least subconsciously your students are noticing this and you're going to notice that they start ignoring your rules more and more. Number three, make it your goal to be a professional. If you're just out of college, you may not have any idea what I'm talking about. So I want to break this down as much as I can. You want to really think about your demeanor or what some people call your teacher persona. Teaching is a lot like being an actor or an actress. I think a lot of young teachers especially kind of go into teaching thinking, I'm just going to be my awesome self and it's going to be amazing. And they might have watched like one too many teacher movies where the teacher jumps up on the desk and is like acting out scenes from Hamlet. But in the real world, that stuff just doesn't work. Students have a certain ideal of what a real teacher is. And if you're doing anything outside of that, they're going to have a tendency to treat you disrespectfully. So if you are a super funny person that, you know, spent six years in the theater, you might want to rein that in a little bit and focus on having a professional demeanor, which is kind but not overly familiar. You also want to act confident and like you know what you're doing and like you believe what you're saying. That might sound obvious, but students smell fear. And if you're unsure of yourself, they're definitely going to take advantage of that. I kind of learned that the hard way. It might sound obvious, but it just needs to be said. Don't yell at kids. Don't argue with them. Don't get into power struggles and don't say or do anything. You wouldn't be comfortable having recorded and uploaded for the whole internet to see. I think at this point, we've all seen enough viral teacher videos to realize it's just not worth it, people. It's just not worth it. Don't try to be a cool teacher and don't try to be your student's best friend. They may act like that's what they want from you, especially if you're young. But the truth is they don't want you to be their best friend. They're looking for people that they can respect and look up to. And a lot of young teachers or new teachers make the mistake of thinking that acting like student's friend is the same as connecting and building a relationship. But as soon as you have to correct them or call them out on something, 
something or call their parents. The whole dynamic is going to change anyway, so better to stick with being a kind authority figure than trying to be overly friendly. You also want to dress like a professional. My general rule is the younger you are, the more important it is that you look like a business professional. Even if you have to go to a thrift store and invest in some blazers and some nice dress pants, it's totally worth it because your appearance really will matter. You also want to think really hard about your word choice and be as positive as humanly possible because in this day and age especially uh, sometimes people are overly sensitive and sometimes they will accidentally or intentionally take what you say and twist it all around and it's totally not worth losing your job because you didn't think carefully about the word choice that you were using. It's also important to get really good at de-escalating tense situations. If anyone is angry in a situation, it's better to pause the conversation and approach it later than to try to force a conversation to happen when a parent or a student or even another adult in the building is really mad. Typically things will happen that everybody regrets in those situations. So always think that you're a professional first and you want to present yourself in a way that's going to make you proud in the future. Number four, you want to take some time out to think through procedures, routines, and even the organization of your classroom. For a lot of new teachers, including myself, the most exciting thing in the world was decorating and making my classroom as beautiful as possible. But I would definitely encourage you to prioritize organization because you can always add more decorations. But if you lose a stack of field trip slips, <laughs> that might not be forgiven or forgotten so easily. Don't ask me how I know. You also really want to think about your entrance routine and your exit routine. What do students do the second that they walk into your classroom? Are they allowed to talk and skip and dance into the classroom or do they need to enter quietly? Is there going to be an assignment waiting for them on the board? Are they supposed to go to their desk and read silently? Just really think through all of that because how you start your class means everything for how the rest of the class is going to function. You also want to think about your exit routines. I know we've all heard the famous saying, the bell doesn't dismiss you, I dismiss you. <laughs> But you want to make sure that your students are aware of that if that's the case. You want to think about the organization of your papers. I cannot say this enough. At a bare minimum, you want to have a place where students can turn in work and a place where either you put graded work or any kind of outgoing papers that need to be handed back. It's also good for the first few weeks to have students practice some of these routines because a lot of times, especially if it's like a middle school or a high school scenario, they might have a lot to remember and they might genuinely forget what your expectations are. Some people even use timers. You would be amazed at the power of the timer. Number five, contact parents early. One of the worst years of my teaching life, I made the mistake of waiting way too long to contact parents. If you couldn't tell, I don't necessarily love confrontation and I don't necessarily love upsetting people. So in my mind, I would always think, oh, things will get better or I'm sure that they're just figuring things out and learning. I'm sure it'll be fine. But again, the longer you wait to deal with problems, problems, they turn from baby problems to monster problems. If there is an incident that happens that you need to contact a parent about, I learned this from a wise principal. You want to try to contact the parent before the student can, because a lot of times I would have students go to, you know, the restroom and call their mom on the cell phone and tell them a made up story. And maybe I forgot about it until like six o'clock in the evening. And then by the time I call, the parent already thinks that they knew what happened and and they're going to be much less likely to believe me, right? Apparently, there's also been studies done that kind of prove the person that tells a story first is the person that's most likely to be believed, whether people realize it or not. So how I would recommend handling this practically is the wonderful world of technology. I used Google Voice, which meant that I could essentially text parents by typing out my message just like I would in an email and sending it on my computer because I could just log into Google Voice from my computer. That way I could do it really discreetly. Nobody knew what I was doing. I didn't have to pull out the phone and like start texting or calling. I could just really discreetly, you know, say, hey, Miss Johnson, unfortunately, Matthew has been having some challenges with following expectations today, but I talked to him and I'll update you on his behavior later. Just something really short and sweet. You could even have a list of like form messages that you just copy and paste and like fill in the name. I totally did that. And that really helps me to kind of get ahead of potential storms. And of course you could always email parents too. If it's not like a really serious emergency situation, I would recommend using the sandwich method.
method, which is basically compliment, problem, compliment. Every once in a while, if a student really did something wrong, I would actually have them call their parents in front of me. And I don't know what it is about that, but it was really effective. As long as they didn't have the kind of parent that was gonna wanna get on the phone with me and like scream at me in front of the class. That may or may not have happened to me before. So you just kind of wanna know as best as you can, like which parents to contact and in which ways. All right, we're gonna switch gears a little bit for number six. It's gonna sound funny, but it was life-changing for me to get this principle down. Okay, you ready? Number six is you don't have to answer every question. I know that some people just audibly gasped just now, like, what, a teacher not answering every question? Let me explain. Students will ask questions for any number of reasons. Some do it just to get you off topic. I know this for a fact because in my freshman English class when I was in high school, we would make bets about who could get the teacher off topic by bringing up some random thing so that we didn't have to do work. <laughs> <laughs> I know it seems crazy that kids would do such a thing, but some students find it funny to get you talking about something that you're really excited about in hopes that you don't get to actually complete the lesson or the assignment. That's a real thing. Sometimes, unfortunately, students will question you as the teacher in kind of a rude and condescending way. Like, why are we reading this book? Why do we have this assignment? Why are you doing it this way? My teacher didn't do it last year that way. Me being the eternally nice person that I am, did it necessarily necessarily realized that this was happening to me that one nightmare year that I had. And because I didn't deal with it well, students found it their like life mission to question me on everything. And I was in the awkward position of being cross-examined by students about my decision for every single thing involved in the curriculum and the assignments and how and why I taught things a certain way. It's just not a good position to be in. So in situations like that, you kind of want to feel it off. It could be like a one-off situation where the it is sincerely wanting to know, but maybe you don't want to put yourself in the position of being cross-examined in front of the classroom. Here's a tip for this. Say, that's a great question. Why don't you ask me after the bell rings? I know it's kind of sneaky, but that way, if they really want to know, they have to take their own personal time to come and ask you. They have to remember to ask you if it really was important to them that they will remember. And it also typically takes the audience out of it. If they really sincerely are having an issue with something, they absolutely will come back to you after class, they will remember and they will ask you even without an audience. You can also have one-liners for the kind of like disrespectful questions that are pretending to be concerned about something, but they're really just trying to undermine your authority. You could just say something like, it's my job to make important decisions like that. I've actually also heard teachers say things like, because it's my name on the outside of the door and when you have your own classroom, you can feel free to do things the way you want. That's not my style necessarily, but if you can, you wanna find kind of a lighthearted way to let them know, you know, what they're doing and that it's not cool. You can also use the magic line, I'm not taking questions right now. For whatever reason, there was like some students that would always have their hand up and would ask you 58 questions back to back if you let them. So when that student is raising your hand, you could just say, oh, I'm not taking questions right now, but I'll let you know when I am. If kids come to you and say, well, my old teacher did it this way and I think it's better. You can say something like, oh, thanks for letting me know. I'll ask her about that later. As it turns out, sometimes kids are just making that up, make you feel bad and they'll be like, oh no, 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 never mind, it's okay. And that's kind of how you'll know with that situation. In somewhat hopefully rare situations, kids will ask you downright rude questions like, miss, are you pregnant? <laughs> every teacher's worst nightmare. You could just simply say, that's really a personal question and it's not actually polite to ask people that. But if you think they did it on purpose to be hurtful and imply you're fat, for example, you could actually call their parents about that and totally say something like, oh, I know that they absolutely didn't mean this, but this is what was said. And I wouldn't want them asking somebody else that and them having the wrong opinion. So I just wanted to let you know. Pretty effective. One bonus rule for you, never make up an answer. If students ask you something that you actually don't don't know, there's several artful ways to handle it. If they're a kind class, you can just say, you know what, I don't know, I'll look that up and get back to you. If for some reason that wouldn't go over well with your class, you could say something like, that's a great question, what do you all think? And there will guaranteed be a know-it-all kid that will be more than happy to raise their hand and answer that question. Or you could simply say, ooh, that's a good question. I would love for you to actually look that up and share with us the answer tomorrow. And that's pretty effective too. But just never, 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 let me repeat, never make up an answer if you don't actually know. Finally, there's 
something called the parking lot. If somebody has a great on topic question that you really don't have time to get to, you can have a little paper in your classroom called the parking lot where either another student that it's their job can write down that question or you can write down the question just so that if there's ever a lull, maybe you've got five minutes before the next thing, you can totally pick a question from the parking lot and talk about it in class or answer that question. But the moral of the story is you do not have to answer every question right this second or else unfortunately some people will take advantage of that. All right, number seven is command respect. This is something that does not come easily for many people, especially in the context of being a teacher. As I talk about in a lot of my videos, there's so many odd philosophies out there today that basically make it acceptable for students to totally disrespect teachers and teachers to just be fine with it. But there are kind, classy, and respectful ways to command respect. For me, respect is a huge core value. And so it was something that once I learned how to do this, I really tried to emphasize in all of my classes. For me, the most common form of disrespect since I taught all grades between fourth and eighth grade was things like eye rolling, head rolling, lip popping. If you don't know what that is, that's like the ugh. <laughs> sound that, you know, young people make. It could look like students turning their back to me and walking away when I'm in the middle of talking to them. It could be me looking at them and speaking to them and them totally ignoring me and like not even acknowledging my existence. In some cases, it looked like kids actually yelling or trying to argue with me. I mean, the examples could be endless, but as I've mentioned in some of my other videos, disrespect is a real issue with the modern generation. And I know, I know it's not just kids or teenagers. It can also be adults too. That's why I think it's really important that teachers take the responsibility to teach students how to be respectful. So how do you do that? You could do a looks like, sounds like, feels like chart where you have students work in partners and have them really identify and isolate the specific actions that would make somebody think that somebody was being disrespectful versus respectful. And I would write down some of those behaviors if the students couldn't come up with them themselves, like eye rolling, lip popping, stomping, groaning, just all of that. And then have the kids come up with alternatives of behavior or teach them how to communicate that they're feeling so frustrated that they're actually not able to speak in a respectful way. How powerful would it be to teach students to be able to communicate? I'm feeling really upset right now. I would really like a break. I apologize, but can we talk about this later? I would way rather a student approach me that way than to like yell and scream and have a temper tantrum and meltdown. Now, obviously, just because you have these conversations, just because you have that anchor chart on your wall, it doesn't necessarily mean that students are going to really act like that initially. But the hard part that I I had to own was that certain students talked to me in ways that they didn't talk to other teachers, which kind of shows me that students a lot of times have the capability of being respectful. They just sometimes decide who they're gonna be disrespectful to and who they're not. And I had to step back and ask myself, am I being too quote unquote nice to where they think that it doesn't matter how they talk to me? So what did I learn to do? I learned to call out disrespect specifically and set boundaries kindly. Now there are all kinds of ways you you can do this. Later on in the school year, if you have a good relationship with a student, sometimes you can use a little bit of humor to diffuse the situation and lighten things up. Several, several times, a student has talked to me crazy and I'll just say, are you talking to me? Oh, I know you couldn't have been talking to me that way. And then the students would have a laugh and then the kid would kind of check themselves and be like, oh, sorry, sorry. If it's kind of a more tense situation that can't be diffused with light humor, I would simply ask the student to correct the specific behavior that they were exhibiting. So the most common one with me was body language. Kids would like tilt their head to the side and like stare up at me and like slump over and just like give me the scary glare. And and so I would just say something like, hey, let's pause for a minute. Can you please, you know, kind of stand up straight and straighten your head? And a lot of times they would. <laughs> Believe it or not, a lot of times they would. If they weren't able to even do something simple like that, I would say something like, it looks like maybe now is not a great time for us to have this conversation. So maybe for now you can sit in the safe seat or go to the buddy room and kind of cool off and we'll have this discussion later. If you're not sure what that terminology comes from, it's BIST. I could do a separate video on that altogether. But it was just a way to diffuse the situation. 
depending on the drama of the situation, I've also had some surprising success with actually asking a student like, hey, I'm curious, do you talk to your mom or your grandma the way you're talking to me right now? And sometimes that might snap them out of it. Or a personal favorite of mine would be asking them, if I talk to my boss the way that you're talking to me right now, would I still have a job tomorrow? And a lot of students will be honest and say, no, you wouldn't. So what you're trying to do in order to command respect is to help students take ownership of disrespectful behavior. And it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, of course, of course, of course, as teachers, we want to talk respectfully to students too. It doesn't work out well if we yell and scream and throw temper tantrums and kind of like provoke students that are already angry and then demand that they are respectful toward us. So I would typically have some kind of conversation with students that looked like me telling them I will always be respectful towards you and I ask that you always be respectful toward me and if that's not able to happen in a conversation we'll take a break and revisit it later. All right number eight document every issue. I learned about this one early in my teaching career and I'm so glad I did. You can think of it as having a journal. If things happen with student misbehavior or something crazy is said in a staff meeting or if you feel like a parent is being unkind to you just have a little notebook write the date write exactly what happened and that way you can keep records of things so that if you ever need to communicate this information to someone you have records. This works really really great with parent contacts depending on the parent and it has more of a potential to work for you with your administration if you can tell them these are the behaviors I've seen these are the interventions I've tried this has been the result and here are the dates. You will be taken a lot more seriously if you're able to kind of have some facts on paper. Number nine, get to know your students. In the first few weeks, you want to try your absolute best to learn everybody's name. Now, I've always done that by playing the name game. I know that that is a game dreaded by introverts all over the world, including myself, but it just happens to be the absolute best way for students to learn each other's name and for you to learn students' names. I've also had two college teachers that I will never forget. They actually took the initiative to look up every single student on their roster, get their picture and write their name on it and learn their names as a flashcard. That totally blew me away. It made me feel so cared about by my teachers. So try your best. I know it's super hard for middle school and high school teachers, but really, really try to learn kids' names. I'd also highly recommend at the start of the school year, having students write a letter to you and ask them to tell you anything that they want you to know about them and anything that you should know about them. I have learned so much information by doing this. Kids have a tendency for whatever reason to be really vulnerable in their writing. And if you can remember small things about them, it means the world to so many students. I also learned a little trick from a veteran teacher during my first year of teaching. There was something called meet the teacher night and I was telling this other teacher, like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to talk about. Like, I'm gonna have nothing to say. And she's like, oh, silly, you don't need to do the talking. Have the parents do the talking. All you need to ask them is, tell me about your child. Is there anything that you would like me to know? Is there anything I should know? And she was like, they will keep talking way more than you even need. And that has been very true. So if you have any kind of meet the teacher night scenario, or even if you're calling to get to know parents, ask them that question to learn about their student and to help everybody know that you actually want to know students. And then of course, during like back to school night or your welcome letter, you'll share a few interesting fun facts about yourself. All right, we finally made it. Number 10, give yourself grace. I know all of this probably sounds so overwhelming and it will feel overwhelming. I'm just going to be honest with you. But you have the rest of the school year to work on these things. You have the rest of the your career to work on these things. There's no such thing as a perfect teacher. So be really, really gracious on yourself. If you would be so kind, please give this video a like and subscribe and share it with your friends. And I would love for my veteran teachers to write some of your favorite teacher tips in the comments. And as always, if there's any ideas that you would like me to talk about, please let me know. And I wish the best of luck to all the new teachers out there. Have a great day. Talk to you guys next time.